Hey YouTube, it's Ed Bud here and today I'm answering viewer questions that you've sent in via the community section of the channel. Before we get to the questions, please make sure you hit the subscribe button and you click the bell for notifications which is just down below. Make sure you like, comment and share the video with your friends. I'm going to try and answer as many questions as I possibly can today, so let's get right to it. So first question up is from Chris Martin. Don't worry Chris, I won't talk about the band that you possibly get asked about all the time. You've probably heard that joke a million times. So he says that his Turbo 2s are currently reaching the end of their life. He's kind of worn them out. Is there anything similar that you could possibly replace them with? He doesn't fancy the Zoom Fly 3. He's already got the Nike Infinity Run. Plus he kind of likes that Nike kind of true to size feel. Hmm. I don't think there's anything really quite like that Turbo 2 for versatility. It's got that lovely soft cushion. It's light, it's got that pacey feel. I think one thing that possibly springs to mind is that Fuel Cell Rebel from New Balance. It's quite a snug fitting shoe, but it's got that nice, soft, responsive feel. Although I'd say it's probably not quite as great as the Turbo 2 with those lower pace miles. I think perhaps the Rincon might be a little bit too narrow in the midfoot and the toe box. It's quite a narrow shoe, that one. Certainly in comparison to the Pegasus Turbo 2. We've already discounted the Zoom Fly 3. Sounds like that one's gonna to be too weighty, too rigid. This is the conundrum, really. I just don't think there's anything quite as versatile as the Pegasus Turbo 2 right now. There's nothing quite like it that's got the same attributes. At least not yet, anyway. Maybe the Adios 4 or 5. Still cushioned in both the heel and toe with a very lightweight upper, very simple design. Maybe that could be an option. So in short, Chris, I'm not entirely sure. I've tested out loads and loads of shoes and this one comes out as being one of the best, really, in terms of versatility. You want to go fast in this, you can and it's quite forgiving if you want to do some slower pace kind of miles. Graham Howells asks if I think that wearing kind of heavier shoes during training and then lighter ones in a race can really benefit an amateur runner. I think it does, Graham. I think a lighter, more nimble shoe on race day is certainly going to make the effort feel that little bit easier and more sustainable. But of course, a lighter shoe could lead to some pacing issues as you progress through a longer run. I think always best to test out a shoe like that in some close to race conditions if you can. Only today I've been out in the next percent again for a harder effort today, uh, closer to my sort of threshold target half marathon pace. Did feel really good today, albeit in very wet and muddy conditions. I also think that using a heavier shoe for training and then a lighter one for racing can have some psychological benefits as well to the runner. I think if you feel light, nimble and untethered, then you're gonna perform that way as well. Those highly cushioned shoes are great really for those long run efforts at lower paces, but I think when you're going faster during a race, like a 10 mile or half marathon or even a marathon, then you want something a little bit lighter on foot. Hope this helps, Graham. It certainly is a ethos that I adopt, try and train as much as I can on those kind of core miles in more cushioned shoes that are perhaps a little heavier them racing in something somewhat lighter. Unshaped13 asks if, I don't know where that comes from, maybe they can let us know. Unshaped13 asks if I have a preference for long or short socks on my races. I kind of prefer those kind of ankle length socks. So I've never really got on with the longer socks. They just always seem to fall down. I was having a chat with my friend James Hutt the other day and you know he said that quite often one of his socks just falls down all the time. I kind of like to worry about nothing other than running when I'm doing a race. I don't really want to have my attention taken away by anything at all. So I always kind of stick with things that I know um, I know it kind of sounds boring, but I think it's a good ethos to have. Stick with what you know, and certainly those ankle length socks seem to work for me. Recently I've been wearing these um, quarter length socks from Balega. I think they're the Enduro type. I don't know what that means. They're a balance between sort of volume and cushion, I think, so there's an awful lot of information on this thing. They feel really nice. They seem to wash well and they dry quickly, which is always a great thing when you're a runner. They also ask if I wear compression layers 
Uh, no, I don't. If it's a little colder outside, I'll tend to put uh, maybe like a Nike vest on underneath a long sleeve, which is what I did today, in fact, just to give me a little bit of extra warmth. That seemed to work really well, actually. On my hips, though, and sort of the upper part of my legs, my thighs there, I do like wearing the half tight, um, those kind of cycle shorts. I guess you always see kind of Mo Farah wearing them, but I kind of really like having those on in the warmer times as well certainly during june july time i like wearing those i tend to adapt my kit quite often actually dependent on the weather i'm always kind of checking my watch checking my phone what's the weather going to be like i fancy myself as a bit of a michael fish or john ketley he was the other famous weather person in england i believe there was a song actually is that something like john ketley is a weatherman and so is michael fish mm, that's good stuff so as I say, I really like things to be spot on in terms of kit. I like to kind of figure out what I'm gonna do beforehand. I hate having to make decisions on the day. That's not a good thing for me. I like to plan, prepare, and prosper. <laughs> With those half tights, I really do like the Nike Pro lineup. They work really well for me. Seem to be quite durable as well. They kind of keep their shape and they don't lose too much of their elasticity. Uh, during races, I tend to use the Nike Aero Swift shorts on top of those half tights and that works a treat for me. You know what it's like with us over here in England, we're always worried about the weather, we're always talking about it. It's one of the chief things that we talk about in the office. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, the oh, weather's cold today, isn't it? Oh, it's, look at that rain out there, what a drab day. You know, that's, that's what we do. I guess someone's gotta do it. William LY asked about speed training and speed workouts, whether I think that's something that could improve his running. What I found, William, is as I started doing some really dedicated half marathon training, that my 5K and my 10K time started dropping as well. I think they improved because I improved my aerobic engine, but I also started adding some speed work regularly into each week of my training. I found that every three weeks or so that a good old part run test was really good to see how much my fitness was improving over the 5K distance. I found sessions like eight by 500 meters at my 5K pace was really, really useful and helped to improve my speed or at least improve my top speed. It also helped with my form, I think, actually, and also my breathing helped me to become accustomed to running at a slightly faster pace. Those kind of sessions for me didn't make the body feel too beat up the next day. I still felt really good. So you can like easily position them into other weeks of your training without too much jiggery pokery and sort of messing around. I've just got a plan, you know, you don't really want to mess things around too much, move things around. Yes, life happens, but I found that type of session was quite easy to implement during the week when I had time. I kind of amped those sessions up eventually to one mile repeats or like 1.25 mile repeats. That really helped me to build sustainability of those higher paces over greater distances. I would stress though, only use those type of sessions sporadically. Don't be doing two or three of them in a week, no way. Maybe one a week just to give your body a chance to recover and I kind of looked forward to them actually after a while because if you're doing some slower miles when you do get a chance to do those speedier sessions you really look forward to them and you really make the most of them as well you want to push yourself and see what you can perform that aside i'm not a coach i'm not a doctor or anything like that but please do use those with caution use some common sense as to how often how frequent they are we don't want any injuries to, to too much paperwork kev burmaster my good buddy and longtime subscriber has asked what sorts of tunes I'm listening to while I'm doing my speed or tempo workouts. And he also asked if I'm listening to music while I'm racing. So let's answer those questions. Kev, over here in the UK, almost all races, all sanctioned races, have a ban on earphones, even bone conduction kind of earphones. They're just not allowed. And I think the main reason is that our roads over here are kind of ridiculous. You've got a couple of lanes at the most. It's normally one going one way and one going the other way. And certainly around here, where I live in Yeovil in Somerset, we're out in the sticks, lots of farms. There's some very small kind of country roads, which you struggle to get one car down, let alone two. So I think it's very hard for them to shut off roads. So what they tend to do to keep everybody safe is to have a blanket ban on earphones. I think this one race I did, uh, Western Supermare, the Christmas Cracker, 
I think you're allowed to wear earphones on that, but the roads that you ran near or on were all closed off. There is a uh, viewer from Western Supermare. I can't quite remember your name, but if you could please comment and let me know and confirm that, I'm pretty sure that that race didn't have a ban on headphones. I can't remember the chap's name now. I, I met him at the end of the race. Hello to you, buddy. I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, but I do appreciate you watching. So when I am training Kev, I love listening to the band Fontaine's DC. Their debut album, Dog Roll, was a fantastic album. Lots and lots of really energetic tunes. They're a group from Ireland originally, and they produce some really driving kind of guitar sounds. There's a kind of real magic, real kind of atmosphere to the songs, but they're, they're still kind of hard and quite caustic. Very atmospheric and full of character. That aside, not all of the tracks on the album are great in terms of speed. There's one or two that really make you want to run fast. Um, I always tend to pick those out whenever I'm going to do some intervals or some very fast paced tempo work. Another great album for speed or tempo stuff I find is the debut album from the Fratellis. Uh, you'll know that name from the Goonies. I think it was the Fratelli family that were the bad guys in that film. This band though I believe were from Scotland and they produced a sensational album back in I think it was 2008. Absolutely stonking tracks. It actually it might be later than that. Let me check. So that debut album by the Fratellis was out in 2006 actually. Uh, that seems like a lifetime ago to me. But the tracks are brilliant. Every single track on that album, Kev, is absolutely brilliant. It's produced in this really driving, almost overdriven and distorted way. Very exciting tracks. Lots of super guitar work. It's hard hitting, it's enthusiastic. You're bound to have heard some of the tracks on there before. There's loads of kind of great sing-along tunes. Um, I have a very fond memory of listening to that album actually uh, with my good buddy James uh, heading to watch Yeovil play Brentford I think. We beat Brentford that day. A really fantastic day. I'll never forget listening to that album with him on the car on the way home. A good album to lighten the mood and promote a very fast cadence. I really love the Mars Volta by the way. Great band. Fellow YouTuber Tim Gross asked if I had to select one shoe for training in one week, what would it be? Well, I've got a ridiculous number of shoes to choose from. Um, it's kind of hard, Tim. Which one could handle, you know, all the sessions that you might want to do in one week? I've got to be honest, I'm actually quite amazed at the versatility of the New Balance 1080 V10. It feels like I've run a lot of miles in this shoe quite slow, for me at least anyway. More in that kind of endurance and recovery kind of pace zone. But when I look through Strava actually, I've run some quite fast sessions in this one. I think up to about sort of seven minutes 10 per mile for me, perhaps a bit heavy for anything beyond that. Maybe the Takumi Sen 6 perhaps, although that's kind of lacking in cushion for those lighter days. I'm not sure about the infinity run either for those faster sessions. That's the bit that kind of breaks the shoes into different categories. I think if there's one shoe I had to pick where I could run all the different paces I want, it would actually be the next percent. Yep, call me crazy, it's a carbon fiber plate shoe. I know there's lots of naysayers out there who oh, shouldn't wear carbon fiber plate shoes all the time. This is obviously a hypothetical question that Tim's presenting to me. And I think that in terms of cushion, in terms of comfort, and in terms of versatility, I think I'd actually go with this. You could certainly run your slower miles in it. It's ridiculously cushioned. It's super light. I've got another pair of them that I could use for racing, so I don't mind mashing these up too much. Yeah. Okay, Tim, I'll go with the Nike Next Percent. I don't think anybody was expecting that. Otherwise, if that wasn't available, I'd go for the Pegasus Turbo 2. Okay. I know it's a cop out and I'm sitting on the fence, but that's a great shoe, okay? Rich K, um, he's asked about gait analysis and whether I think it's a really important thing to do. He's had his gait analysed and they've kind of pushed him towards stability shoes and it's really injured him, actually. It's caused him loads of issues and problems. So do we need it? So I've had numerous gait analyses in different running shoe stores and stuff like that. And they've always pushed me towards neutral shoes. I've said I've got a relatively neutral kind of running gait. I get lots of YouTubers actually give me really good advice about how to improve my uh, running form. And I'm always really appreciative to get that advice 
Um, not so appreciative to just get naysayers telling me I'm going to get injured all the time and so on so on. Touch wood, got to be honest, I haven't been injured for a really long time. Have you? I've got a view on gait analysis and stability shoes. My wife uh, some time ago was told to opt for a stability shoe due to her running gait. I think she overpronated somewhat and they pushed her towards some stability based shoes from Adidas. My personal experience of that is that that tends to cause more problems than it does solve problems. I think the analogy of the cliffside here is very important, where the water kind of washes away at things, it keeps hitting the cliffside and eventually the cliff erodes and it becomes what it needs to be. I think that if you wear a shoe like that, a stability shoe, it kind of forces your body to do things that perhaps it doesn't want to do. You've spent a long time walking, running, you know, since you were a little toddler up through to when you were a fully grown woman and then your kind of feet and your ankles are being pushed to do things that are unnatural to them. I don't see how that can help at all. I think if you have a really bad issue, then obviously maybe a stability shoe is the only way to go. But I don't think she had a bad issue. Our bodies are built to kind of be flexible to a degree and compensate for some inaccuracies in our movement. So I think stopping the body from doing that isn't always the best option. I often wonder whether my wife ultimately having to cease running due to her causing her lots of problems was down to those stability shoes. And whether if she had some more neutral footwear, that may not have been an issue at all. I think spending some time warming up, warming down, being sensible about our recovery times. I mean, today I've run quite a hard session. I've sat around and I've relaxed. I've chilled out, I've watched some TV, I've eaten some Chinese food. I think those things are really important to do. Sometimes you've just got to say, today I'm having a rest day. I am going to let my body recuperate and recover. I think careful management of those miles helps to kind of keep myself fit as a fiddle. So gait analysis aside, is it necessary? Well, I would suggest it's good to see if there's a significant underlying problem. Otherwise, wear shoes that feel good, they feel comfortable, and it feels as if you can perform without hesitation. Right guys, that's all of the time I've got for today. Thanks for all your questions that you've sent in. I've really enjoyed answering them. I'll try and get round to some more of those, perhaps towards the end of next week. Thanks for watching guys through to the end of the video. Please make sure you subscribe and you click the bell for notifications just below. Make sure you like the video, comment below, and share it with your friends. My name's Ed Bud, and I'll be seeing you.